Winton, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you. All right, I want to welcome y'all to our second Skane's Domain, where we discuss issues significant and trivial with the same type of feeling. Uh, we're going to talk tonight of something called jazz stories. I grew up, my father's a jazz musician, and I would always notice the mysterious thing about them was how they would listen to recordings and know who was playing by their sound. And they would start talking about, oh, man, that must be Frog. Or, no, man, that's not Frog, that's Jug. And everybody always had a hip nickname. And they would start questioning who was who. And then when the, when the disc jockey would come on and say, that was Gene Amos, oh, I knew that was... I knew that was Jug, but I also noticed that they used stories to teach you lessons. There were always stories about fantastic musicians, things that they did, occurrences. They taught you history. They taught you how to feel about life. And later when I was older, we would have fantastic hangs at the North Sea Jazz Festival, the Montreux Jazz Festival, VN Jazz Festival. All the musicians of all the generations would be together and we could just sit up and listen to musicians tell stories. I'll never forget one night when I was 18, I was with Art Blakey on a tour of Europe and all the greatest drummers in the world were there playing some type of festival. There was Max Roach, there was Elvin Jones, there was Buddy Rich, there was Art Blakey, Danny Richmond, just great after great. I just sat up all night listening to them tell fantastic stories. So I'm gonna start us off tonight with a couple of stories. Uh, I'm gonna start with a story about the great Sweet Edison. I met him when I was 14 years old and I used to go to the gigs. It was only gigs for what I thought at that time for old folks. But Sweets was one of the most colorful characters. And when I met him, he, was, he had been a member of the legendary Count Basie Orchestra that swung the country into better health during the Great Depression and right on into the swing era. Matter of fact, in the 1950s on those Columbia sides, uh, uh, Frank Sinatra wouldn't even record without Sweets. He was funny, he was full of down home wit and Sweets was a great mentor. His nickname for me was Baby Boy. And he would say in the very country, well, Baby Boy, it don't sound like you're playing too much to me tonight. And he had a way of, of talking around your deficiencies. For example, he was known for playing just a few notes and getting the most meaning out of them, but I would play a million notes. So he would tell me after I played a solo, he'd say, well, damn boy, you just played more notes than I played my entire damn career. And the implication was, and didn't play nothing. He thought I sounded too much like Freddie Hubbard and Miles. So he would say, of course, back then, you couldn't imitate people because they, they might just walk in and catch you stealing their stuff. One time he actually sent me a brand new trumpet of Selma. It, was, it, was, it wasn't a new trumpet, but it was a, a, a trumpet that he had had, that, a trumpet that he had not played that much, a Selma K modified. And there was a note on the trumpet. It said, maybe this will put some weight on your sound because those long tones don't seem to be working. I once asked Sweets, man, how do you start off your solos with such urgency and just go deeper from there? He said, after you make up your mind, baby boy, there ain't but one way to play. Ain't but one way. So Sweets was a fount of, of so much uh, information. And we would always go to the same restaurant in Los Angeles called Maurice's Snack and Chat. And he would eat grits and brains. And I was like, man, I don't have nothing to do with any type of organ. Even though you know I'm from the South, I can't handle no brains. And uh, he always had a white Seville or Beeritz Cadillac. He would come pick me up in that Cadillac. And one time, I'll tell you a real, real extremely soulful story. We were rehearsing with the septet, fantastic septet I had of great musicians. We were rehearsing in the, in the, in the hotel in Los Angeles. And Sweets called me in the morning. I said, man, we have no rehearsal. He said, how many of y'all they got in there? I said, it's like it's seven, eight of us with our sound man. Sweet showed up 45 minutes later with eight breakfasts for all of us. And we sat down and ate with him. I'll tell you another great story about a trumpet player. I knew his name was Cyril. He's a New Orleans trumpeter. We used to play in a big band that were rehearsed at the Musicians Union building on a Sunday. And I always hated going to these rehearsals because it meant I had to miss football. But uh, I was in high school and uh, he, he called me once, the Cyril called me to play a parade. He said, you got to come meet me on Fred Street at one o'clock, we're going to do this parade. So I went to do the parade. And, and when you're playing the parade in, in New Orleans, you, look, you get tired because you're playing the concert and you're outside, the sound never comes back to you. So when we got out in the parade, oh, I was, I was trying to, I didn't know all the songs. So I would ask Cyril, what key is this in Cyril? And he would just press his fingers down, always trumpet players will know, with an alternate fingering. So if it was the key of G, he would press one and three. If it was something, so I had to figure out scramblers to see what was going on. But as the parade went on, Cyril stopped playing. 
and he was just being fabulous through the parade, blowing kisses at the people, talking, and all people loved him. And in and, and these parades, we would stop at different bars and different places, and people had food for us, like a, a, sh a shrimp po' boy sandwich or something. Cyril had the best food, and he had the people treating him so good, and he would say all the time, they don't do this in New York. They don't do this in Detroit. They don't do this in Los Angeles. So the whole parade, instead of playing, he was talking about, they don't do this in... And this was in a kind of period in the 70s when there was always some type of shooting in the parade. And in this parade, sure enough, people start shooting. Bob, we start scrambling down the street. And Cyril was kind of heavy. So he was like trying to keep his, his belt and his pants and everything on. And we were running down the street, looking at each other. We start laughing. He looked at me and said, they don't do this in New York. They don't do this in Los Angeles. So, you know, you have uh, colorful things. I'm going to tell you all one more story. And I'm, I'm, uh, I got some special guests storytellers and this one is about the great Sarah Vaughan. When I was 21 I had the opportunity to play with her at Boston Symphony Hall. We exchanged pleasantries and salutations in one of the backstage rooms and I thought I would impress her by playing an obscure Duke Ellington song called Tonight I Shall Sleep With a Smile Upon My Face. And it was a kind of beat up old piano and the piece is very sophisticated and has an involved melody and very advanced harmonies. I knew that there was probably not a 21 year old on the planet who knew this song. And I assumed that that ignorance applied to all. So I asked her, Miss Vaughn, do you know this song? Oh, I played it through with very rudimentary piano skills and a few incorrect harmonies on the coda. At that time, of course, I didn't know that she had grown up playing organ in her mother's church, played second piano and organ in Earl Hines' orchestra, had played second piano in Billy Eckstein's orchestra, same one that featured Dizzy Gillespie, uh, Dexter Gordon, Charlie Parker, Gene Ammons, Art Blakey, and she could accompany herself singing very well. She said, wow, that's a great song, Duke. But you played some wrong changes on the coda, baby. Then she sat down and played the complete coda flawlessly and with so much technique, I thought, damn, she plays the piano like that, but is chosen to sing? And she looked at me and said, look, if you want to learn something, you have to learn it all. You learn tunes, figure out how the melody is constructed, then learn the logic and the supporting harmonies. That way you'll never forget the song. You understand the what and the why. She finished making her point by playing the entire song with all kinds of alternate harmonies and elegant improvisational responses to the melody. And she concluded and looked at me and said, you see, baby? I said, yes, ma'am, I see. And she nodded and smiled. So that's my three stories I wanted to start off y'all with. And we got uh, some special guests on the line. We have a great Mr. Christian McBride. And I know he's, he's in the rhythm section. I first met Mr. McBride when he was 14. He was, he, the, the song he asked me to play, he was playing on the piano was called Skane's Domain. <laughs> so I didn't know anybody knew that song. He could play it on the piano. And I, I've loved him for such a long time. We had a, a high school orchestra with him in it. He was great then. So I'm so happy to have him join us. And he's just flowered in, in this time. And I, I love him and have such a feeling of pride just when I see him. So Mr. Christian McBride. Well, big, big brother, it is an honor to be a part of your party this evening. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've loved you from the day I first heard you. And uh, it's hard to believe that's been, um, I know, right? <laughs> There's a three in the front of that number. That's, that's <laughs> tricky. Woo. Right. But uh, again, thanks for having me. And it's great to be with, uh, with all of you this evening. Um, I wanted to tell the story that um, when you were actually there when this happened, you, you weren't there in the, uh, mm -hmm. in the actual place this happened, but you were in the, you were in the building. Uh -huh. And in the fall of 1991, uh, we were quite honored to record an album with the late, great Joe Henderson. Uh, uh, it was called Lush Life, the music of Billy Strayhorn. And um, went and played trumpet, Stephen Scott played piano, and Greg Hutchinson played drums. And uh, a great story from that session. Um, I remember we recorded on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. And on our Thursday off, uh, Joe Henderson booked a gig in Philly. We played at the Painted Bride in Philadelphia. And uh, he used Greg and myself and a pianist named Junko Onishi. And uh, on our off day, we, we went to Philly 
and we played this gig at the Painted Bride. And uh, after the gig was over, Joe said, um, McBride, I'll pay you for the gig tomorrow afternoon once we get to the studio. Cool, no problem. And so uh, Greg and I uh, hung out after the gig. We actually almost got into a major, major car accident on the way back to New York because uh, Greg said, hey, man, you, you, got to, you got to take me to where they have the ultimate cheese steak, you know? And so we went and ate cheese steaks at like one o'clock in the morning. And you know, when you eat something that heavy that late at night, you get sleepy. Not supposed to be making a two hour drive after you do that. But you know, we were young and dumb. Uh, thank God we made it. But anyway, we get to the studio the next day and uh, we get halfway through the session. And I said, uh, hey Joe, um, is it cool if I get that bread from you from, from the gig last night? He said, uh, you know, in order, to, in order to imitate Joe Henderson, you must have, uh, you must do this. Because Joe Henderson always wore glasses and he was constantly pushing his glasses up. I said, Joe, can I get that bread from you from last night? He's like, uh, yeah, let's go, in the, uh, let's go in the parking lot. So we go out in the parking lot. And um, I said, Joe, I, I'm sorry I forgot to ask you, but uh, how much did the gig pay? Joe said, well, how much you want? I said, well, how much you offering? I said, well, I give you two, 200, I give you 250, I give you three. I said, well, I mean, I think I'd be remiss not to take the, the, the bigger number, so give me 300. I said, 300, all right, cool. Reaches in his pocket, pulls out a huge wad of $20 bills. And uh, he starts counting literally like this. 20. How old are you again, McBride? I said, I'm 19. He says, 19? Huh. You know how old I was before I made $300 on my first gig? Man, I don't think I was, I probably wasn't, man, I don't think I was, until my mid-30s, I got 40. And, you know, I think, um, you know, back when I was playing with Hard Silver, uh, we were probably making $300 a week uh, and we had to take our own hotels, you know, 60. And, um, you know, one, one of the is, McBride, you're going to be a band leader and you're going to understand that you're going to have all kinds of responsibility, not just for music, but you're going to have to deal with the, you're going to have to deal with the finances. You're going to have to deal with all this kind of 80. And in fact, now that I think of it in 1975, uh, I think I got paid. Yeah, that's when I made my first three hundred dollars, and a hundred. So the long and short of this story was: it took Joe Henderson one hour and five minutes to count up the three hundred. <laughs> now I'm convinced that he was trying. He wanted me to like just kind of give up and be like, "Look, Joe, just give me the two. Just give me the two fifty. I'm I'm cool." But I I I went toe to toe with Joe Henderson and I won. I got my three hundred dollars. And uh, I wound up making two more albums with him and a lot more gigs, so it worked out perfectly. But every time I think of Joe Henderson, I remember him counting out that $300 in, in 65 minutes. That was deep. <laughs> <laughs> May Joe Henderson rest in peace. <laughs> yes, may he. I was on a tour with Joe, with, uh, with Herbie, Ron, and Tony. At the end mm. of the gig, they would play on Broadway. George Benson was on the gig. So then I was maybe 19. But when they would play on Broadway, I would leave. So every night I would walk off the bass and Joe, he did not tell me one word for the whole tour. The last gig we played was in Houston. And uh, he looked over at me and he said, he didn't like the way George was introducing him. So he said, because George would introduce him as the very quiet but powerful Mr. Joe Henderson. So he looked at me, there's a whole tour now we played. He looked at me and said, why does he keep introducing me like that? So I was so shocked he told me something because we normally would just stand in the back. I was like, I <laughs> and then when we got near the near the near on Broadway, he looked at me and said, Are you gonna space tonight? I said, Yeah, I'm spacing. He said, I'll space if you space. <laughs> so, so we both space. Joe Hen, one of a Joe kind. Hen, yeah, Joe Hen was something, man. I mean, it's just oh his plan, his sophistication. Lord. I'm telling you, I'm telling Ted you. Murphy. You know, you know, them arpeggios, Joe always be practicing. Absolutely. He was practicing arpeggios up on harmonics and stuff all the time. And then he'd play a solo. And man, it'd be like all kind of harmonic sophistication. And Man, listen, we, he, the, the, that performance of him playing Lush Life of solo tenor, 
um, that's one of the greatest examples of, uh, of pure virtuosity and imagination and, and skill and, and emotion. Um, everything he played on that, on that performance, particularly, you know, because that's a, that's a very, uh, it's a very deep song as we all know. And the fact that, uh, he even, he chose to play that song unaccompanied saxophone and, and just absolutely killed it. That's uh, that's a testament to his greatness. Oh yeah. He's great. He's great. Very concentrated when he plays too. Oh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I'd gone, I'd gone on the road before I played with Joe played on a recording with me in 1980. Seven or eighty-eight, one of those years before I'd gone on the road with Charlie Rouse, and Charlie uh, Rouse was afraid of flying. At that time, I was not afraid of flying, so I'd be, man, you're gonna drive all over the place in the in the, in the car, and we'd be teasing him kind of. But he told us one night we were playing. You know, we play all the kind of wild stuff with Nasmo King and all of that. He right. said, "Man, I hear all that stuff y'all playing, but you ever think that maybe the new thing is in your sound?" Right. And I thought, wow. And to me, that's how Joe, just his sound that's right. was, was evocative of so much. It has such a timeless quality to it. That's right. That's right. And I, I can't, it's, it's really hard to say that, I, I, you know, a lot of people too easily um, assert things like uh, Joe Henderson was sort of like a Coltrane clone or uh, a lot of his ideas came from Coltrane. While that, while that may be true to a large extent, I can think of no other person that has a sound like Joe Henderson. That really is such a singular sound. Right. Nobody else has a sound like that. Right. You know, yeah, and that was one of the sweetest things that he would always say too. If I can't tell you about your sound, you're not playing nothing, baby. Right. Your sound right. is your your sound is your business card. <laughs> there you go. And I'm That's trying it. to figure out who you are. I don't really know who you are. You got to you got to let me hear you. <laughs> hey man, Sweet. you know, thank you, man. Thank you for coming in, Chris. If you don't have nowhere to go, hang with us, man. In case we get to something, but if you gotta go, you know, I love you. It's I ain't going nowhere. You. I'll be okay. right here. Oh man, great. I'm so jumping. Jump Veronica is the great Veronica Swift is here. She's the daughter of a jazz musician, so she knows. I'm gonna just turn it over to her and let her break stuff down. She has some great stories to tell. Hi. Well, I mean, I don't have. For me, my stories, most of them happened. Um, I'm, I'm actually making new stories now for myself in my early 20s as a lot of the crazy stories happened in, that, in those years. Like you and uh, Christian, y'all have been playing with such uh, amazing musicians and legendary musicians in your 20s. And for me, my, a lot of my stories that I have to share are actually from my childhood because that's uh, more so when I was, you know, I was on the road with mom and dad. Uh, for those of you who don't know, mom and dad, my mom is Stephanie Nicassian, my father, Hot O'Brien great late in that order and uh they they uh took me on the road with them when i was a kid and that's how i grew up with this music and uh i have a lot of cool stories um you know one of them actually was with you winton i, I know you i was hoping you would remember and then we went on the holiday tour and i said do you remember and you said to me spitting rice and because when i <laughs> I was I was blown away in that moment because I didn't think you'd remember, and then I knew. Well, this guy remembers everything. I better be careful. <laughs> and and um, when I was nine, I, I went to Dizzy's for the first time, and that was when I was playing trumpet. I thought I was going to be a trumpet player before any of the singing, and um, I, I wanted so badly to meet Winton. And uh, I guess I forget how I got I got to meet you. I got to meet him and he sat me down for, for a couple minutes and we were talking about embouchure and uh, you know, you gotta pretend like you're spitting rice. And we were doing a couple of, you know, you know, back in, in the back of Dizzy's. And even when I go there now, it's so nice to, to remember that moment. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Winton. Well, and, thank, uh, <laughs> thank you. And, and uh, I have a, a, I actually, when I was um, growing up, mom, when I, when, I knew I was going to be doing this. Uh, I guess it, jazz singing, you know, it started kind of making its way into my life uh, professionally when I was around the age of, technically I was nine, but really 13 was when I started singing, you know, really deep into the repertoire. And mom, since she was with John Hendricks on the road for a good number of years in the 80s, she, she had a lot of access to, uh, you know, bootleg recordings and stuff like old cassettes and stuff she'd show me. And I'd learn a lot of the old vocalese stuff that hasn't been recorded, uh, like Room 608, a lot of other stuff. Um, and I just loved Annie Ross as a kid uh, and, and now, and I, she's always been a hero of mine. And, um, cause there, you know, back then 
uh, and a lot of the bebop singers were mostly male. It was a male dominated uh, kind of style of singing. And Annie Ross, uh, you know, Vivon, there were very few females that did that. And so I loved Annie, how she sounded like a trumpet. And um, when I was 12, I went to go see Annie at, I think it was Metropolitan Room. And Jim Coleman, my good buddy, he took me um, and mom and dad to the Metropolitan Room. And uh, she was playing with Juan Vache, who uh, had been on the road with my parents for a bit. So he was always around. And um, I don't know how it happened, but Annie invited me to come up and sing on her set. Uh, this little 12 year old kid, you know, <laughs> that was one of the scariest moments of my life. Cause I, but, but, you know, back, I guess when you're that young, it's scary, but you don't really know the weight of the situation. So you're, mm -hmm. you kind of just, oh, I'll, I'll do it. What the hell? <laughs> uh -huh. And I just go up and I went to the band. I, I said, thank you, Annie. You're a big, I'm a big fan. And then I, I said to the band, I says, do you guys know Twisted? <laughs> Of course, Twisted was one of Annie's most famous lyrics, uh, vocalese lyrics. Of course they knew Twisted. What was I thinking? So I sang Twisted um, at Annie Ross's show, and I was 12, and we basically hung out the rest of the night. She sat down, and we were having, uh, of course, I had my Shirley Temple, and she had her whatever. And that was, one of, that was probably one of my most amazing uh, moments for me. It was, I, I was my first time kind of legitimized with the, you know some of my heroes and and uh we've been friends ever since and i she called me one time um she found my number i guess through jim and she called me and i, I got she left a message so i i get home from a trip and i hear on the voicemail hi this is annie annie ross and she gave me her number and then she said i want to talk about what gowns you have <laughs> <laughs> I was 13. I got no gowns. Wait, <laughs> that was pretty funny. But uh, I and Paquito's here. Um, I actually Paquito. I have a funny story with you. See, most of my stories with you guys because I'm I'm only mm -hmm. I'm 25. I have yet to have some really you know big big moments. But so, there has been some really amazing moments for me. And uh, one of them I remember. I was maybe 16. Paquito. I don't know if you remember this, but that was my first time meeting you. We were at the Telluride Jazz Festival, which I had been there uh, every year since I was like 10 years old. And um, Paquito was doing, he was the guest of honor that year. And I was part of the jazz, uh, the Telluride Jazz All-Stars, which was a youth group. A lot of young jazz musicians come up through that group. And I don't know how Paquito, I guess he heard me at the jam session or something. I was, you know, 16 and he heard me scatting. And he was like, well, I would love to have you come up and scat on some tunes. And he had us up on his, you know, the big stage and Paquito de Rivera, oh my God. And so I, I went up there with my friend Ben Cruz, a guitar player, and Paquito called uh, All the Things You Are. I was like, okay, yeah, I know, I know those changes. And I was scatting, sing the melody and scatted on them. And then halfway through the, my second chorus, I think Paquito changed the key. And I was like, oh, he's messing with me. I gotta <laughs> keep my ears open. You know, we aren't, we're, of course, we're not gonna go through All the Things You Are in the same key and the same, you know, uh, time in Mark, you know, not four four. So he went to he went to different time signatures, and he changed the the key signature a bunch. And I had to just keep <laughs> keep on. And it was that was a, a great learning experience for me. And uh, I guess I I hung with it enough that I was in uh, I was in good with Paquito. <laughs> and um, I just remember sticking his tongue out on me on stage. <laughs> uh -huh. And that was really fun. Um, you know, as I, you know, tell a lot of my vocalist uh, students and friends, you know, always keep your ears open. You know, just because you're singing the song doesn't mean so someone isn't going to throw something at you. <laughs> so right. that was a lot of good experiences that taught me a lot and kind of uh, I was uh, reminded that yeah, I'm in the I'm on the right track. I'm in with the right people. Mm -hmm. Well, you know one thing. We, we one thing we gotta we gotta get used to when we when we doing these stories on the telephone we don't have nobody cosigning us they're not mm hmm mm hmm you need those little cosigns so you feel like you're just talking into empty space but we hear you <laughs> you know we we hear what you're saying so uh thank you you know I noticed I want one thing that you were talking about Paquito so I, I don't know where we are on time so I want to bring him in there and uh I mean we all we all love him so much he's a man with so much uh, 
integrity and just musical ability. I'm not, I just want to, I'm going to just let him, if he's on here, I want to, whatever he says is, is valuable and worth hearing. He has some of the greatest stories you've ever heard. What you talking about, Pac-Man? Winton, we're trying to get uh, Paquito in right now. Um, okay. Yeah, let's, let's just give him another 10 seconds or so. And if not, let's go to Jeff and then we can come back to him. Okay. Well, we, we're having trouble getting Paquito on. But, you know, I could ask Veronica just one more thing. I noticed we went on tour with her. And she sings songs absolutely differently every night. And she has an unbelievable type of uh, variety. And we had also gone on tour with John Hendricks years ago. He was in his 70s, and he went out and played football with us on a Saturday afternoon. Two hours he was playing ball. So I just want to ask you, Veronica, about your approach to just how, how differently you do things. And, and uh, what, what, what's, what is your, your attitude about just being in the moment and, and going for your thing? Well, just like, uh, I mean, you can understand it's uh, something that, it's not, it's not like a technique or an exercise you can practice, really. It's just going out and doing it as much as you can all the time and, and uh, being throwing yourself into those situations where you have to do something differently. Like, uh, I will constantly sing or pick a tune and say, let's do it in a different key tonight. Let's do it and try to throw it. Like, if I am at a jam session, I'll completely well, let's do this a fourth away from the key i usually do it when i you know back when i was going to jam sessions more often um uh, i would do that to try to see if i if it would if i would sing it differently um but also just uh emotionally your life changes um and i had a lot of things happen to me even in just the past eight years that uh have really changed my perspective on tunes and i sing tunes differently um because I, I would think about the different times I would sing them differently, you know, mm -hmm. uh, whether I was like, you don't know what love is. I used to sing it all spiteful and angry and fast. And now I'm like, well, I've gone through something else that might, I might sing it slower or, um, you know, mm -hmm. much messing around with back phrasing and front phrasing that will uh, invo evoke a different emotion. Um, or, uh, you know, just looking at, like I had a gone through a, a whole, I had a house actually uh, going, I had lost a house to a fire right when I went to college. And uh, that piano in the house was my mom's piano. My grandfather gave to her and it was like a Steinway B grand from 1962. Um, very special piano. And it, we actually, they saved it. And once that happened, like the concept of home changed. And there are different things, you know, that, that love, home, family, all this stuff changes throughout your life and you have to constantly re go back to all these tunes you've been playing for some people decades I guess and what do I know I'm only 25 but you know even now I'm seeing changes so um, mm -hmm. yep. in a moment like that yeah yeah I mean that's and that's a, that's especially a good for for right now because we're all in situations we're not normally in even with our families exactly. so we discover a lot of new things well somebody who knows about that is Paquito because uh, he he left the the, the where he, where he grew up and he came here. So is, do we have Paquito now? Are we able to hear him? Or? I don't think he's in yet. But let me okay let me try one more time. Well, you know what? We have another person who's going to come in here, and this is one of the funniest people in the world. I have the honor of sitting next to him when we judge the essentially Ellington Jazz Band Festival and competition. He is a fount of knowledge. He's one of the most generous, uh, just open-hearted kindest people and uh just an absolute pleasure to be around and a fantastic musician let's hear from jeff hamilton hey so you you think i'm funny do you yeah man you're funny <laughs> you're the hammer man come on uh, hey, it's nice to be here i'm sorry it took me a minute to figure this out i am a zoom rookie if you will so uh i apologize for that but i'm glad to be on and hi veronica nice to hear your stories as well um uh, i missed uh, hi i missed uh, Christian's story that says I'm probably better off because I know he was talking about me like a dog so I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll catch up about him later on but I did hear your story about Sweets Edison and his white Cadillac and and uh, the color white struck me uh, funny in a different way because as, as we know Sweets had all of these great sayings that uh, that just have lived on in, in all of our hearts uh, of all of us who knew him and on his 80th birthday in Paris, we were with the Philip Morris Superband with Gene Harris and James Moody and Ray Brown and 
and uh, the great, you know, great band, all-star band. And uh, on his birthday, he had a white suit on and was dapper as always, as, as you remember. And Jeff Clayton, who had been uh, taking a lot of teasing, we should keep Jeff in our thoughts also for uh, better health. And mm. uh, he was, and he was being uh, funny, uh, being acting nervous, trying to get the first piece of piece of, of, of birthday cake that Sweets was cutting for himself. So we're all lined up after the rehearsal and a, a sound check, and it was a surprise. And Sweets takes the knife and he cuts this this beautiful piece of cake, and he gets it over, and Jeff Clayton is shaking with the plate in front of sweets like this yet like hurry, hurry i'm hungry and sweets puts the the cake on the plate and the plate falls face down on sweets white pants of his <laughs> <laughs> and you could have <laughs> drop in that room the air went out of the room and all of a sudden you hear sweets say I was going to give you the first piece of cake, but you were standing there shaking like a dog trying to pass a peach pit. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the white Cadillac, the white suit, they, they all go together. <laughs> right. Uh, Man, so, come uh, on, you got, you yeah, got so oh, many of them. All right, some yeah. more sweets, Jeff. Well, sweets, sweets was... Uh, we, it don't have to be uh, sweets. You can okay. give us whatever. You, you got plenty of them. All right. Um, I think one of my fondest memories, uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, food is very important to many musicians on the road and where you're going to eat is usually the, the first knowledgeable part of the itinerary. You have your restaurants where you're going and where are you guys playing tonight? Well, I'm not sure, but I know where we're eating after the gig. So <laughs> this was true, true also with, with Oscar Peterson's group when I was in the band from 90 to 95 with Ray Brown and Herbie Ellis. And... Um, my first dinner was was it was quite an ordeal like here i am with these guys this is unbelievable and i mean i wasn't a kid but you know i was in, in my early 30s and still i'm in, in the presence of greatness so we get to this uh, private uh, dining room the oscar had, had been told by uh, norman grants you know gourmet restaurant we show up and we're in our tuxedos from the limo to the uh, from the concert hall to the to the private dining room and Oscar's sitting across from me and raised to Oscar's right. And then I'm, I'm next. And then Herbie is next to me. Waiter says, Dr. Peterson, what may I get you? And he said, this is in the, uh, France. He says, what may I get you? He said, I'd like the 24 ounce bone in steak with the, uh, I'll start with the, um, the uh, full Caesar salad and the, um, I'll have the potatoes, Leonese. I'll start with the French onion soup. Let's do that. And the potatoes, Leonese and a side of um, asparagus and I see it takes uh, 20 minutes for the chocolate souffle. So, you know, I'll have a chocolate souffle. And I had just dropped about 25 pounds playing tennis and working out and trying to you get healthy. It goes to Ray and the waiter says, and you, sir? Yeah, well, you know, I'll have the French onion soup too and the Caesar salad and um, I'll have the double cut pork chops and uh, <laughs> I'll have the asparagus and, uh, and I'll, I'll have one of those souffles too. That sounds good. Waiter comes around to me and says, and you, sir? And I said, I would like the chicken Caesar salad, please. And Oscar <laughs> leaps over to Ray and he says, I guess your boy doesn't want to be in the band too much longer, does he? <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, and I'd like the 24 ounce bone in steak, please. You know? <laughs> so so hey. these are just, just some of the things that happen on the road that, uh, that, as you know, get into the music as well. You get on the bandstand and, and you see these little grins and raises of uh, people's eyebrows and they're you're remembering these stories as you know right hey, hey, hey hammer hey how you doing I, what's up man you. <laughs> hey, did, did you tell the story that i might was going to tell too about us playing together well i was going to suggest that you tell them that story our, our german saga <laughs> i'll let you finish it but we, we were we were both asked to be in uh, in berlin uh, for Alan Bergman, you know, Alan and Marilyn Bergman, the great lyricist, and Alan was going to sing uh, a, 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 a whole LP of his, uh, his, of their composition, their, 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 their songs that they had written lyrics to. And so they, they flew Christian McBride and I over from the United States to be in the rhythm section as an all German orchestra, excellent orchestra. Young Till Bruner was on that. Do you remember Christian? Yeah. And, um, and we played, what was it? Three days of ballads, you know, windmills, right. of, windmills of your mind and, you know, all these lovely songs. And we're going, man, this is beautiful. But 
can we get a coffee? You know, I mean, it was just one after the other. And so Christian had to get back to the United States on the fourth day. So he splits and they bring in a very talented German bass player. He's, he's, he's still one of my favorite bass players. But the first tempo they counted off was, let's take it nice and easy. And I looked at him like, why didn't you do this when McBride was here? <laughs> And, and every time, every time that we played together, we did one hit with Diana Krall, and it was it was a mostly a ballad night, and we just kept looking at each other like, "We're cursed. Are we doing something wrong, man?" Right. You know? <laughs> now, now, fast forward to the recent jazz cruise, and I'll let you take over, Christian. Oh, hey, man! Look, I my suit now just got dry after all that sweating we did on that cruise, <laughs> playing hard, man. We we had so much fun, man. I mean, I don't think we played any ballads on the cruise, did we? We wanted to make sure we we buried no. that curse. That's <laughs> right. Neither one of us would have let that happen. That's there's right. With, there's a, I remember there's this interview yeah. of uh, with Miles. I think I don't know if it's on YouTube or not, but. I, it was in the 70s, so he wasn't doing a lot of, you know, ballads and swing stuff. But uh, I remember, I forget where I saw this, but uh, someone asked Miles, Miles, why don't you play ballads anymore? And Miles goes, because I like playing ballads too much. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was something yeah. crazy. Wow, I've never well, thought of we, that We way. always <laughs> loved playing ballads, but not for three straight days. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, Joe, Joey D. Francesco wanted to do a trio set with Christian and with me on the cruise, and we said, "Yeah, you know." And I thought, "Well, that's weird because Joey played the Hammond B3. I, 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 why does he want to use a bass player, even if it is Christian?" You know, I said, "Okay, well, then let's do that." So, like the day before, it's like, "Oh no, I, I'm going to play piano. I'm not going to play organ." You know, so we said, "Well, okay," and. Boy, did Joey stomp all over it, didn't he, Christian? It was oh, he crazy. killed it. it was well, great. as as uh, Winton knows, he was there. Like that's that's how most of us came to know Joey in in the early days. Is was oh, as okay. a pianist. That's right. Okay. That's right. And, um, too, right when he was like a teenager. I knew he played the organ, but you know, you obviously, you know, I don't think there's any public high school in the world that has a Hammond B3 in their in their music. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, right. yeah, Joey, Joey's Joey's always been. That that freaky talented guy. Yeah, right. it's great to hear no, him if, he, if, again. if he would have called a ballad that night on the cruise, it would have been man overboard. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> All right, guys, I've got Paquito here, so let's add him into the mix. All, All right. right. <laughs> Hi, Paquito. Pac Man. Oh, oh. Let's see. I see him. Paquito had a great cruise uh, event too uh, we hit some, we hit some pretty heavy water one year and he was on the stage and i don't know if he'll uh, tell that story or not but the audience was in stitches when that happened if he's around i don't want to think about it <sighs> we got him well i thought okay. we did okay we're gonna we're gonna what we're gonna do is we're gonna tell a, a, another story i'll tell another story thank you hammer Thank you, Christian. Thank you, Veronica. And then we're going to open it up for you all. If you have questions, you want to hear a story. If you have a good story, you can briefly tell. Um, I'm going to just conclude talking about uh, how how you doing. I can see you now, Paquito. Can can you be heard? One, two, three. Can you hear me there? Can you hear me there? there? <laughs> Great. We, we got you. Maybe the, maybe the machine, maybe the machine thinks I am speaking in Spanish or something. <laughs> <laughs> Are you hearing me there? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. You hear me there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very good. You say something about Telluride. I love that place. It's fun, uh -huh. right? Beautiful. It's a, it's a little too high for, for my taste, you know? It's a very high altitude, so, so I have to breathe two, two or three times to play a phrase. Mm -hmm. It's a uh, little uncomfortable. It's a nice place to play. So what, what good story you got for us, Paquito? Huh? What, 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 what good story? You got plenty of stories, man. Every time I see you, you telling good ones. What, give, give us a good story. You know that I... Give, give me <laughs> 
Pero hoy. Encontraste la música que habías perdido. Yo no sé qué estaba hablando. No, no. You the one that, it's, it's, oye, I hear you, if, like, if you are playing a, a piano in the story. Right. Uh-huh. I, I can hear very, very, very badly. Well, just tell us the story. You don't have to hear us. We can hear you. Oh, can you hear me there? Yes. <laughs> we can hear you. <laughs> okay. You you want to hear uh, an story? Uh, uh, I, I I was playing very many years ago with a uh, friend of mine who played the bass. I was supposed to do a duet with him. His name is Bobby Carcasses. Probably you may have him in Cuba. He's a singer and dancer and, and do every type of thing. He's a painter also. And then uh, almost ready to leave. To, to the venue, this friend of uh, a friend of us came with a tenor saxophone, and he said, "I, I was given this saxophone." I said, "Oh, my, my, I didn't know you played the saxophone." He said, "Well, I, I will try. Can you go? Can I go with you?" Said, yeah, of course. Said, Where are you going? No, we are going to this school in in uh, in, in very close to Tropicana. It's a it's a it's a school that they are celebrating something there. So we went there. Bobby came with the bass. And I, I have my, maybe my auto and all that. And there was a guy who approached us. And it's, we, we play a couple of things. And then uh, this guy come to us and say, can you play And I Love Her? This, this song by the Beatles, you know. And I love her, right? Everybody knows that, that song. And, and Bobby say, yeah, 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 yeah. I know. I remember that the bass was like, boom, 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 boom. And then you play the melody. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. And then Anselmo was the friend of the, the, the friend with the saxophone. He was struggling putting together the saxophone because he never put together the saxophone before his life. So, Finally, he got put the, the, the read and everything, and then Bobby did pom 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 pom, and and Selma started playing something like, then then ten minutes of that, and at the end of the, of the song, the guy. Uh oh. Oh, <laughs> uh, I think we lost him for a second. Well, let's give him a minute to 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 reset here. It, it was going good to that point. Uh, now I froze. Oh. Okay, we get you. You on? Go ahead. Very good. You know, this te technology for me is something terrible. <laughs> that is good. So, so Paquito, so tell us, he was playing, blah, 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 and then Bobby said, what happened? No, you know, the, the, the guy didn't know how to play the saxophone. He was uh, trying to try to do some type of free jazz or something. I don't know. But boom, 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 boom. Blah, 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 blah. He played all that for 10 minutes. <laughs> and then the, probably the guy was waiting for the melody. And then when we, start, when you, when we stopped playing, the guy came again and said, can you play now? And I love her. Those are the things that happen, happen to us, you know, in, during this crazy business of ours. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Paquito. Now we're going to get you back. We're going we're gonna to have our technology hooked up a little better. Thank you very much. It's terrible. It, yeah. it, tell Christian that we, we have to we have to uh, to compose a, a piece together for the New York Symphony. We have to talk about that, Chris. That's correct. Yeah, I'm, it's, I'm, going I'm, a, it's going to be a lot of fun. That guy is a monster uh, horn player. Yes, he is. Let, let's get together and work that out, man. Very good. Let's get me in, in touch to see what are you what are you writing in, in order to do some type of contrast. You know, 
I am writing a, 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 a section called uh, Dali in the Tropics. So let's <laughs> talk about it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. All right. Good, my brother. Okay. Well, y'all, y'all got a lot of time. That's one thing for sure. Exactly. <laughs> Tell me about it. Right. <laughs> we got a lot of time on it. So, <laughs> so I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm gonna end with one quick story about my father. And, and, and then when he was our high school teacher. So the first day of class, he would get four kids to stand up and stand in the middle of the room. And we would all stand back to back. And then he would say, describe what you're seeing. So each person, the person facing the window say, oh, I see windows. Another person say, oh, I see a clock and I see a... If we put everything that y'all see together, there's still a lot more in this room that none of y'all saw. Right. So I want you to open your understanding up. Mm-hmm. And uh, he used to always say that uh, he believes in everybody's right to choose. And he celebrates the courage required to actually make the choice. He say talking about something is different from choosing it. Once you choose it, you get everything that comes with it. And a lot of that everything only shows up after you've chosen. The other one was, are you talking? Are you talking about doing? Or are you doing? And he really hated critical talk. Like if your if your only authority was your mouth, if you're too hard on a ball player or something, or even on a meal, he would say, son, the best form of criticism is demonstration. I've seen you play ball, or what have you ever cooked? <laughs> so I just want I just want to shout him out. And I, I always got to, re- got to recognize and remember the first time I heard about Fakito was from my father in the early 70s, listening to Ira Kere uh, talk about how great the band was when, when nobody, we, did, we didn't even, weren't aware of that kind of music at all. So uh, I want to thank y'all for, for, uh, for, for checking out our stories and all our special guest musicians, fantastic. Hammer, thank you. Christian, Veronica, Fakito, thank you so much. And now we're gonna go over to Adam, and we're gonna. If y'all have any questions, or I don't know how much time we have, but yeah, we've got another. Questions. We've got another twenty, twenty-five minutes, something like that. So let's start taking okay. some questions. Great. Hope I get to see everyone before it's you know before the end of the year at least. Yeah. <laughs> have, have mercy. Let's let's pray. All right. Yeah. All right. First question um, is from Hugo Dart, and Hugo, you ready to go? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, an honor to be here, uh, Winton, with you and all of your amazing guests. And it's wonderful to see you again. The first time I saw you was in 2002, and I can prove it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't show that to the hammer, man. I'm not going to live that down. <laughs> well, there you go. Wait, wait, where are my glasses? Where are my glasses? <laughs> <laughs> and you had uh, just given a talk about Art Blakey. It was amazing. And then there was a concert of the uh, Lincoln Center Orchestra the next day, and it was just fantastic. And I'm so grateful I got to see you. And I got to see Bramford here. I'm in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, last year, I got to see Bramford here. A few years ago, I got to see Adelphio here. And uh, six years ago, I got to see Jason and your father at the Snug Harbor. So, big fan of the whole family. And uh, what I'd like to say is, uh, towards the end of uh, the first session of these uh, conversations uh, you had uh, about a week ago, one of the last questions was about uh, your role as an educator. And uh, I've always admired you enormously as, as, of course, a musician. You've been my favorite musician for as long as I can remember. But uh, uh, your role as an educator, and uh, I know that a lot of people say that about you and uh, highlight your role as a, a music educator. But I'm an English teacher here in Brazil, and uh, I don't know how aware you are of uh, what a big influence you are in education as a whole. In 2012, I heard uh, you talking to the, it was your speech at the uh, uh, Band Director Academy, and you were talking about the 12 principles of jazz. And I was so, so amazed by that. I actually created a, a talk that I delivered at the Conference of English Teachers 
relating the principles, the 12 principles of jazz to principles of language teaching. And I've been doing that and I've been following you ever since. And uh, always quoting you, uh, something that I, I'll never forget and I often quote is when you say, uh, we all want to embrace one another and we just don't know how and the answer is not more education but more substantive and more culturally based education. So uh, something that was said about a week ago is uh, how wonderful it would be if uh, we could somehow collect these lectures, these talks that you have given because you actually have so much to say not only in terms of music education but education as a whole and I'm so indebted to you as I'm sure many many people are for your role as, as an educator. Uh, again, not only related to music, and uh, I'm deeply, deeply thankful uh, to you for that. Now, I know I should ask a question, so uh, here it is. Considering uh, uh, the different times we're living in and how so much of education is now moving online uh, forcefully because of the situation, I'm now starting teaching classes online full-time tomorrow, and so many, many people are because of the, the, the pandemic. Uh, do you think that that's going to have a more profound impact in the world of music as well, as all of you are also uh, having to, to communicate and collaborate so much online and, and from a distance, at least for some time? Will that have a, a big effect, do you think, in uh, the world of music as well? Okay, I, I think I, I'm going to give a brief answer. And if, uh, if hey, I'm a Christian, Veronica, anybody wants to talk, Quito. Uh, I think it's, it's going to have a big impact for the better. I think that we realize something about the world, how close we are. We're musicians, so we have a chance to be in Rio and to be all over the world and meet meet people. Uh, I embrace, even though I'm, I'm in that with technology, I embrace the technology. I think it's made uh, the world a better place. We can come closer together. The question is not the technology is just a tool. It's how do we use it? So I'm glad to have the opportunity to talk to you over line with everybody else. We're all listening and talking. I'm glad to see Paquito. I'm glad to see Christian. And even though we've known each other for many years, I, I don't. I, we don't have video calls. And this situation has forced us to embrace each other with another type of uh, of depth and feeling. I think this is a tremendous cool school, uh, a tremendous tool for education. And if we think about all the scientists that are working on solving the problem with this virus, think about how they're using technology to come together. And I was stretching across borders so that when there's finally a solution to it. This technology is going to make it much more possible. And, and I, I think we should not confuse the abuse of a tool with the tool itself. Like when people first started taking photographs, every, every photograph they saw was of somebody new. So people's conclusion was fo fo photography is not good. It's just how it was being used. So uh, I, I love this as a tool and it's great for, for education. I, I don't think know so too. Yeah. I think it's a, I think it's important to 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 use what we have in uh, in order to educate people. And uh, I remember once uh, talking about the correct use of things, the the correct use of of, of advance. Once you say a phrase that is stay with me of the today, when you say microphones are created to embellish the music not to cover it right and th this you know we got uh, well i i, I wrote a, an article about the the excess volume uh, recently i have two two or three of them all right because microphone was a great invention the same way that technology is a great invention but you have to use it wisely because if not technology will absorb your 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 self and, and you spend too much time on it you you want to use it in a way that this they can be help helpful for you and for the education of others it's what i think is important to have in mind like everything in life that word is to, to use it with moderation and in the correct way i i agree i agree and i also think that we have to look at it as a way of exposure perhaps to the education of the of the music student or the music listener but the serious musician or the serious music student to me still has to sit next to a master and see them in action and know how they change from sticks to brushes subtly to see how the drums are tuned to see the ins and outs of uh, of learning uh, right there on the job to see how to do it instead of 
a lot of times you you can't get that just from watching a screen so i think that's that's good to a certain point but if you're going to be serious about it i think you have to be uh you have to be sitting next to a mentor at some point six feet distance <laughs> that's right, right. right. <laughs> true all right thank you hugo for your question thank you all right Let's see. Next up, we've got Andrew Tillman. Andrew, go ahead. Thanks for having me, uh, Winton. And it's great getting to hear you guys' stories and everything y'all have to say. Um, but I had two questions, kind of going to try to kill two birds with one stone here. Mm -hmm. But um, I've been trained as a jazz musician. I have, I'm only in high school. Um, mm -hmm. I'm only 17. But... I feel like I, I don't, I've never played classical. Do you need to play classical to be a really good jazz musician? Because that's kind of the vibe I'm getting down here. And I'm, I'm from Alabama. And I don't know if that's right or not, but I'd just love to hear your take on that. Okay, you don't, you don't, need, to do, you don't need to do another thing to learn how to do the thing you're trying to do. It helps the more things you know. I had a great teacher who lived in Alabama, a great big John McElroy in high school. So I want to shout him out in Alabama and uh, in, in, in Birmingham. When I was in high school, he was my teacher. Uh, if you want to learn how to do something, study that thing. Uh, but it never hurts to have more education. And don't feel like you need to make a choice. Uh, human, human beings, we add knowledge. And there's things that we all learn from each other. There's, and, and, the, the more you know, the more you know. But to be good at a thing, you need to know how to do that thing. And I think the hammer pointed out when he talked about how you have to be next to it and close to it and look at it and see it. And you have to love it. And uh, you know, like, like people, all music is connected. It's just a matter of you learning enough to start connecting those, those dots. But I don't want you to feel any negative about learning stuff. There's no negative about learning. Even stuff you don't like. If you learn about it, you know, you can make a more intelligent yeah decision and that's that's really how my daddy was with, with teaching too he hated you to call any group of people they if you start saying they too much he say hey man who is they do you know them have you met them <laughs> you're right who are you who, who are they <laughs> yeah. you know so i encourage you to, to study but i mean christian he, he could answer it I, I met him he was playing all kind of music he went to juilliard i mean he does what do you think, Christian? Well, you know, I was just going to jump in and say that uh, if the word classical itself means timeless and will always be valid no matter what time frame we're in, then jazz is classical. You know, tell, let, always remember that Thelonious Monk's music is going to be great 100 years from now. It's classical music. You know what I mean? Now, I think that what, what, what that question usually means is, does one need to be trained in symphonic uh, or, or, or like, uh, you know, uh, European symphony music to be a better jazz musician. Um, just like Winton said, it, it certainly won't harm you, but I surely don't mm -hmm. think that that is a prerequisite on becoming a better jazz musician. Right. I right, was at Indiana, uh, at Indiana University in a percussion major uh, and uh, was studying timpani with the great George Gaber. And I wanted to play drum set, and I, I was ready to get on the road, and I, I left after two years. And uh, my first night on the new Tommy Dorsey band, I'm playing Opus One, and I'm looking over at the ride cymbal, I'm swinging, I'm saying, yeah, that's enough of school and the classical education and all that, and man, I'm swinging. And I kept looking at my right hand, and I said, and this is the timpani grip that Dr. Gaber showed me how to play timpani. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, right. so it's all that, connected, right. whether we're aware right. of it or not, it's right. all connected and it can be right. helpful for you. And right. From, See. And from a vocalist perspective too, yeah. like, um, well, like the actual technical, uh, the technicalities of the instrument, what actually, a lot of questions I get when I'm with uh, schools and whatnot, they say, how do you have such pitch precision? And uh, when you jump intervals and I say, you know, for me, that was when I was uh, a kid, I was obsessed with Bobby McFerrin. So what he, what, did, what did he do? He would sing these Bach preludes. And I was like, how do you sing that? And so just, you know, singing that stuff, um, when I was playing on piano and I would just sing it, I was able to apply that to my jazz education and also with just like i'm obsessed with opera i sang opera for many years i from the vocal for vocalists out there listening you know 
I was obsessed with the stories that were in these operas, you know, such intricacies in drama that I was then able to apply to jazz. And it's all, you know, they're constantly informing each other. So. Right. And Bobby's, Bobby's daddy was an opera singer. And Bobby, like Joe Henderson, when you be around Bobby, because we were real good friends from when, when, when we were, you know, young in the 20s, he would be, ooh, ooh, ee, ooh, ooh, ee. he'd be practicing these intervals constantly. And you'd be like, man, what are you working on? So then <laughs> after some years passed, you realize what he was doing. But I, yeah, I got to go with the hammer. Another thing is I don't, I'm not a fan of all this kind of wanting to denigrate classical music. And you got to realize that, you know, the composers like Shostakovich and, and Beethoven, Stravinsky, Schoenberg, the level of sacrifice that they had for music, and they also did not say, we want to take our music to elevate a group over other people. That wasn't their philosophy. The right. music cost them too much. And if they were here and you could meet them and talk with them, they'd be just as soulful as, 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 the, as the hammer. And, and, and Veronica, Christian, what we're talking about, Paquito. And uh, Paquito plays fantastic any style of music. So we don't, we don't in this era, we really don't have to, to right. discriminate, but it's hard to learn now. I'm gonna just tell you this. When you get to these Learn, learning, forms, learning is always great. Le learning is, is very important all, all the time. Uh, always, I say that there is a division between what they call the jazz education and the music edu uh, and the classical music education. We ignore each uh, sides, and that's a mistake. Because, for example, classical musicians are are, are, are missing the freshness, the youth of jazz music. On the other side, jazz people that don't want to listen to the other side, they are missing centuries of, of, of music education composer intonation. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. As, yeah. Like as a saxophone player. Yeah. Exa exaggerated volume and uh, staccato. You know, I, I, I just wrote a uh, a book about articulation in in jazz music. Too many people try to try to ignore. And I mentioned Winter in this uh, this conversation the other day. I say I love the way that people like Claudio Roditi or Winton Marsalis or Woody Shaw play because I can hear the the uh, the, uh, the articulation in the playing. Many too many jazz players they they used to to play everything legato and sound like. And what about so ta 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 ta? What about some staccato? The the other day I went I went with a big band, a guy who played beautiful in the style of Ben Webster, things things like that. And then I wrote a tango. It's, I wrote an arrangement. Uh, Pedro Giraldo wrote an arrangement of the famous Liber Tango by uh, Astro Piazzolla. And then the saxophones have this this figure para pa pa para pa para para and the guys that play no 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 staccato well there was no no way that, that the guy played like that why because uh they have been ignoring the staccato that you 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 uh, you learn in the book by by Closeo Cavallini I think it's important to, to know different types of music. And on the other side, sometimes you go to a symphony orchestra and they play Stravinsky with so much ease. And then when you when you uh, uh, write a syncopation, like party, ba, pa, pa, ay, ay, ay. You can spend the entire morning trying to do that. So what I mean is that it's important to know uh, a whole expression of different styles of music in order to be a better musician, a better artist. Sir. To learn from each, uh, each other. It's but that, I, that way I've been doing all my life. Right. You, you uh, definitely are an example of it in the, in, the, in the unbelievable range and clarity of your playing. But it also, I want to say that the modern symphonic musicians don't have any of this kind of prejudice like what it what it was years ago. I mean, they, what it was, that's right. They're yeah. unbelievably yeah. collegial. I work with symphonic orchestras, St. Louis Symphony, Philadelphia Orchestra. I just love them, and the, the yeah. orchestras are just as uh, beautiful and filled with people who want to know about music and study and play, and they're unbelievably serious about being for real. So you know, we 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 still have a ways to go, 
but if I was you, you're 17, learn how to play all, all, all this stuff. But whatever you like to play, play that. If you want to play jazz, play that. If you like to play classical music, play it. If you don't like to play it, don't play it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a lot of it is I just need to find like a little more of a balance because I've only ever played jazz. So maybe throw in some elements of classical so you can get more of that intonation and control. Well, get your, yeah. your Arbus <laughs> book out. That's, get your Arbus yeah. book out and do those, those 150 50 arts art of phrasing. Yeah. I got I to gotta quote my brother. I got to quote my brother Ryan Kaiser. He always says, "Less Facebook and more Ar more Arbus book." <laughs> yeah. <You know? laughs> All right. Thanks, Andrew, for your question. Yeah. Thank, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you're right. All right, guys. We've got time for just one more. Um, before I get to that, just want to remind everybody that we've got a pretty amazing lineup of live events that we'll be hosting um, throughout the coming days and weeks. Um, we'll have question and answer sessions with Winton and special guests, master classes, and conversations with members of the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra, live performances, free education classes. Um, so keep an eye out for all that. Um, our last question will be coming from Uni Mojica. Uh -oh. Uni, you're unmuted. Go ahead. That's a good name. What up, Uni? Mojica. Uni Mojica. <laughs> Uni, can you hear us? Don't waste that good name, Uni. Come on. <laughs> I can see her here. Hold on. Let's try this one more time. Well, having, oh wait. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear me? You there, Uni? Okay, great. Hey. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Uni, you're here. Okay. Hey, everyone. Thanks Hello. for taking the meeting. <laughs> um, I'll make my question pretty uh, brief. Um, one thing that I really love about the music is how it's included multi-disciplines between dancers and comedians and poets and things like that and I'd love to hear your guys stories um, that you've experienced with people from other other artists from other disciplines and how um, they have changed or affected your playing and your writing and things of that nature well I'm gonna make Winton laugh on this one being a drummer and if you've seen what I look like especially you'll you'll find this uh, humorous. I, I was asked uh, several times uh, uh, until about, I don't know, five or six years ago, if I ever danced professionally, that I looked like I could be a ballet dancer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our time is up, Uni, so thank you for calling. <laughs> I think uh, the, the the, mo the motions, the, the graceful motions of the brushes and, and the lateral motion from the cymbals and around the drum set, I think the flow of what, what I do is what, what uh, prompted those kind of questions. But I, I did get asked that quite often, um, especially in earlier years. But I think, it, again, it's all connected. It's all rhythm, uh, no, yeah. dancers, dancers of torts with, with, with time. Uh, uh, Carl Sandberg was just celebrated by Matt Wilson's group poetry. I mean, it, it, it's all creative. And I think we're all connected uh, somehow. But usually, the rhythm, I think, is, is usually the connector. Oh. Amen. Right. Yes, sir. It, it, you know, Uni, I wanted to say that, um, you know, it, I think there have been so many great artists from across so many different disciplines. And, and Jeff is absolutely right. It's the rhythm that connects all of us together. Uh, be it a poet, be it a uh, a dancer, be it a comedian, uh, there's a rhythm, there's a timing that uh, I think has deeply influenced all of us on this on the Zoom tonight. Uh, I got to tell you, for um, for my entire childhood, for every like every third or fourth record in the house, you know, we had like two R and B records, a jazz album, and then a comedy album. You know, so my whole life was James Brown, Coltrane, and Flip Wilson. You know what I mean? So all three of those people have played a major part in, in, in my upbringing. And then later on, when I got to start playing with people like uh, Amiri Baraka and uh, the great Sonia Sanchez, who was actually on my new CD, uh, to, to hear how they put those things together 
are their words and their rhythm and, and how they uh, create their poetry. It's a, it's a uh, direct influence. Right. And not just the rhythm. I mean, for me, it's rhythm in the storytelling. Um, you know, whether you, just like right here, we're all, what are we doing? We're telling stories. Um, as a musician, whether you're a musician or actor or a filmmaker or photographer, you're trying to convey a story. And it's the marriage between those two that connect all of these different mediums. And, right. um, and I mean, for, before I was even singing, I, I remember I was always uh, writing novels and, and scripts. And right, actually right now I'm working on a film and I think that a lot of musicians and artists feel pressured if you're doing kind of one thing to be like, you know, that's what you do. Um, and if you, if that's all you want to do, that's fine. But if you, you feel like you're being limited and you want to do other things, that shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't feel limited and you should always feel like you can express yourself in these different mediums. And I think a lot of, um, because of the, the, you know, it's important to brand yourself and all that stuff too. But I, I think one thing I remember when we had uh, we had talked that one time about um, you were ex you were encouraging me to write. Uh, you know, do you write articles? Do you write? You know, and um, I was able to then reconnect with my childhood again. Like, oh, I, you know, maybe I should write more. And, and I think it's important to you know right. uh, collaborate with other uh, types of artists, not just musicians. Because you'll be inspired to, you know, tap into that. Right. In, in, my, in my case, it's, it's a very inspiring. When I have to write something, if somebody gives me lyrics, the pen goes faster. You know, a good poem inspires me to write the melody immediately. Otherwise, I have to think about what I am going to write. When I have the lyrics, the half of the, of the melody or whatever, the, the, the half of the music is written already. It's, it's, it's very inspired. The same thing happened with dancers, improvising with dancers, yeah. people that can dance to you, to, uh, to you, sometimes even solo, people that can improvise on your playing while you improvise on the, on the, on the steps they do. You know, of, uh, since I was a little, little kid, I feel that all arts are in, interrelated. It's, a, it's what you call a cross pollination. Mm -hmm. Hey, you see, I learned a new word in English, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Maybe I they don't that, deport me that now. <laughs> you know, I, I've been I've been lucky in my my time out here playing. First, I was mentored by a lot of artists. Romer Bearden, unbelievable artist. When I first met him, I didn't know anything about it. He told me learn mythology. Ralph Ellison, go up to his house, and he just found of information. Fantastic. Right, August Wilson and I, once we walked all the way from the, the village all the way up into the heart of Harlem, talking the entire time just about art and Shakespeare and plays. Uh, Garth Fagan, I did ballets with him. He's just unbelievable teacher and educator. Showed me so much stuff. Yeah. Alvin Ailey had the opportunity to be uh, be around uh, around him and see what, what, what he was talking about. Did, a, did a, a piece with Maya Angelou. Once again, just all kinds of uh, education. I love William Butler Yeats, the Irish poet, and Matisse the French artist. And uh, I'm going I'm to I'm end by telling y'all a story about Rich, Richard Pryor. In 1985, I was called to write music for the semi-autobiographical Richard Pryor movie called Jojo Dance of Your Life is Called. Well, back then, I had never written music for a movie, and I wasn't even known as a composer. So I thought, why was he calling me? But because it was Richard, and I grew up loving him, I said I would try. Well, the movie was complicated when I saw it. It had all kinds of flashbacks, different scenarios. It required a deep knowledge and a broad range of, of, of understanding of American music. It was beyond what I knew at that time. And scoring the movie was going to require a skill set far beyond my ability. Considering that this was also Richard's debut as a director, there was no way in the world I could agree to mess up this man's movie <laughs> in, in a, with an inappropriate score. So I went out to Los Angeles to meet him. Now, his house was set back behind a huge gate with lights all around it. And in the foyer, he had a white piano and a piece of classical music displayed on the piano stand. It looked like nobody had ever played it. We sat down and talked about music and his love of jazz. He said he had opened for Miles back in the day and actually lived in Miles' brownstone for a while. So he talked about all the comedians and how the jazz musicians shared the same funda fundamental values of improvisation in the moment timing and making stark realities and plain truths digestible. One thing I want to say about him was how intelligent he was. What I always noticed about jazz musicians since I was a kid, 
just the depth of intelligence of Dizzy or Miles. Or, so, so Richard Pryor was exactly like that, talking about history and what he needed to know. Now, after some conversation about New Orleans and how wild the population was, we got down to talking about the movie. I told him, man, I don't think I know enough to do a credible job of this. So I started to explain it. And he listened to me and he said, how old are you? I said, 24. He looked at me with a straight face and said, man, when I was 24, I wasn't turning down shit. <laughs> <laughs> we laughed and that was basically it. You know, the music came out later. I think Herbie wrote the music for us. But i never forget, I, he told you he was very patient. So uh, we want to thank y'all, you know, for tuning in to Skane's Domain. We're going to be back and we discuss significant and trivial things with gusto. Uh, everybody who, who came with us, thank you for staying with us. And to all my, my special guests, I love every one of y'all. You're some of the greatest musicians in the world and human beings. Till we meet again. Thank Take you. Care. Thank you, Winston. Right. 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 The Hammer. <laughs> Christian. Veronica. No Pac-Man. <laughs>